first of all, I want to thank get this off the I want to thank John Noriega, who's the director of the Chicago Studies Research Center, for uh, uh, saying yes to the videotaping of the writers and the son to come here. And I want to thank uh, Rebecca Epstein, who was the events coordinator, and then you said. Guerra, I don't know if she's here, but she's the librarian and she was very helpful, very helpful too. So those people, thank you so much for doing this. And then also uh, thanking Marco to uh, taking time from his uh, attorney business in the Bay Area to come down and uh, uh, kind of a short notice in some ways. No? Yeah. And uh, uh, we met back in 1987, or for the first time, when I was visiting professor at, at Stanford and he was up in the, in the Bay Area. And, I, and a student that I had had back east at Yale, who had written that post analysis, senior thesis advisor, uh, had come out to uh, San Francisco and he said I met Acosta's son at a party. And so I said, well, I want to meet him too. So he did come to Palo Alto and we went in May, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 1987. And uh, then we met again through San Francisco, and he took me through the places, the haunts, you know, of Brown Buffalo in San Francisco. Those places, they weren't there anymore. At least Trader Jages, it was not part of the, of the landscape anymore at, uh, in San Francisco. And then he gave me lots of materials uh, about his father, which then became a chapter in one of, in one of my books. So it's, uh, just reminiscing on the way, on the way from uh, the airport to here, you know, about what has happened to our lives in, in between. You know? Now he's an attorney, so, uh, practicing attorney. He was just beginning law school at the time when I, when I met him. Right. He, was, he was a kid when I. Yeah. We were all kids <laughs> at one time. Uh, yeah. So it's good to to have Marco. Marco. I'll just say, do you want to say some things? Uh, well, yeah, thanks for inviting me down. I, I, uh, I'm happy to do it, and uh, I would uh, be happy to come in another time. You know, if, if uh, you, sure. Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, uh, it, it's, I, I've, um, uh, I've, I've uh, appeared at a couple of uh, other schools. I was just trying to think of the last time. It's been a while, but uh, uh, like a you know, question and answer uh, kind of a format. Chicago studies for me, but, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've always, uh, you know, uh, been a, uh, kind of uh, uh, observed the development of this uh, field, you know, over the last 30 years, and uh, uh, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an honor. I, I mean, it is an honor, really, uh, to, to be part of this. Um, I don't pretend to be a writer myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not... Uh, Certainly not trying to follow my dad's footsteps. Uh, you know, I have uh, I, I have two young school age girls and a wife, and and, and I, I work as a lawyer up in the Bay Area, and so um, you know that's pretty much what my life is, and uh, I'm really happy doing that. And uh, you know, so I, I but uh, trying to uh, you know tr trying to follow somebody like this, I, I just you know I wouldn't even really consider it. <laughs> so I. Yeah, I, I, in some ways, you know, it's been kind of like something that I want to kind of uh, just kind of observe, and uh, but I know it's part of my past, and so you know I have to um, acknowledge that. And uh, but um, it's been very interesting, though, for, for me to see all the you know the, the growth of this body of literature, uh, uh, and I, I'm I'm sure that uh, it's you know the, the foundation has been laid. This area, uh, uh, such that I think it's you know it's going to be, um, you know it's it's definitely a a, a, f a field that continues to grow and you know people contribute to it year after year. So, sure. sure. Uh, and as I tell my class uh, with the, the two first books, you know, uh, that really dealt with the urban uh, area, you know, and she kind of she kind of literature before it then rural, uh, New Mexico, rural Texas, and then in 1972 we have uh, Brown Buffalo, 1973 we have cockroach people, and then one is San Francisco and the other one is, is Los Angeles. 
And so to have uh, those two books address the issues and problems of, of the urban scene with brown buffalo, it's a comparison between Riverbank, you know, where your dad was born, and the, the sectioned off city, but in some ways repeated also in, in San Francisco as he drives through San Francisco. He makes sure to note the ethnicity of each section of San Francisco, the black area, the Italian area, the Chinese area. So in some way then, uh, uh, from 60s to 1960s back to the 40s and 50s, Right. Your dad does that with, with that book, and then Revolt of the Cockroach People, which is about the Chicano movement in, in East LA, you know, right. and Los Angeles at a time when things were, in a sense, ex exploding you know, in terms of uh, a Chicano movement. And your father then uh, became a public figure here in Los Angeles. We didn't know anything about Oscar Zeta Costa because he was Oscar Acosta, and then he came down here and he became Oscar Zeta Costa. And part of the, of the movement and that's how we know your father through the books or things you know that uh, we have read that I've given to to the class but uh, you knew yeah. him uh, as as his son and maybe uh, you could start by telling us something that you know about his family or his you're named after your grandfather I think, uh, Manuel. yeah yeah I, my my full name is Marco Federico Manuel Acosta and so uh, uh, my my dad uh, married a um, a uh, uh, an American uh, lady. Um, I guess you could call her an Anglo. Uh, originally from St. Louis uh, uh, and uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, yeah, Federico was uh, they that that name was after a Spanish poet, and then Manuel's okay. Fed Federico Great Lorca. to know that. <laughs> so, that. My mom was a fan of his. You're his named work. after Federico Garcia. Lorca. Federico Garcia Lorca. And okay, then great. Manuel is the uh, grandfather. Oh, that's what you. That's yeah. Manuel. Manuel. Right. Acosta and Juana Fierro. And Juana Fierro on the, uh, the grandmother's side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Did you tell us about your grandparents and our relationship to uh, to your dad? Or? Uh, you know, it, it's it's a very complicated subject. Uh, I mean, I, you know. I, Obviously, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, get it all out in the, the time that we have here. But, it, but I, I would, uh, you know, it, it was a very um, uh, conflicted family. They, uh, they, they, they uh, my grandparents came up from Mexico um, in the uh, '30s, and um, so they were, you know, that generation that was trying to assimilate, trying to be American. Um, you know, trying to make sure that, uh, that everybody spoke English, and um, <clears throat> you know, they wanted their kids to be like all American. You know, and and, and, and uh, you know, my dad was uh, in in school. He was always, uh, you know, he, he played you know in the in the, uh, in the band and and, and all, you know, never missed a day of class, and it was you know really active and you know just tried to fit in. So, the, the you know the 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 parents, my grandparents, uh, I thought always. Uh, they always supported uh, education. They didn't have much education themselves, but uh, I, I remember that being, a, you know, something that they really uh, encouraged all the kids. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and some of them did, some of them didn't. Um, but um, my dad was the. Uh, there was five kids all together, and the oldest, uh, his brother, um, died about 15 years back. But uh, um, he went to law school, so he was, he went to graduate from college and then started law school up in San Francisco, and then uh, unfortunately got hooked on heroin and, you know, got in, kind of started taking that uh, track and, uh, you know, sort of self-destructed. And uh, so he never really uh, managed to get out of that, but my dad, I guess, you know, you could say also he's self-destructed in a way, but um, he was, uh, I think, a little more motivated and uh, um, very driven. And uh, I, you know, you, I think you can see that in his, uh, just in his, uh, the things that he did, uh, you know, he, he was always doing something, you know, he was, if it was not, you know, as a writer, uh, he, you know, wanted to practice law and become, you know, uh, uh, do that for a while and then, and then, uh, 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 and then travel and, and he, he was always, I, I think writing really was um, his passion. 
actually. But uh, I guess the point is, is that the, my my grandparents. Uh, I, it's kind of funny because I think he really took after my grandmother. My grandmother was that way, very uh, driven, and you know I, I have a lot of memories of them. You know when I was a kid because they they lived in uh, the uh, little town that Hector referred to. Uh, Riverbank. It's right next to a place called Desto, and a uh, little town in the Central Valley, um, about two hours outside of San Francisco. And so I used to go there um, during the uh, summers, and uh, a lot of times during the uh, year also I would go down for the weekend. And uh, so you know, I, I I got to know that area quite well. Um, but uh, 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 they, you know that. My, my, my grandmother was always really uh, just couldn't sit still. You know, she always had to be doing something, and you know whether it was uh, reading a newspaper, or, uh, you know watching the news, uh, working, you know cooking, dealing with the kids, and uh, uh, and so I, I, th I think my uh, my dad kind of took after her more than. Uh, uh, but but they, they had a you know they had a I, I think a, a a a pretty good relationship, uh, but you know. Again, uh, you have to keep in mind this is, uh, you know, uh, 40s and 50s, and, and uh, parenting was uh, not really what it um, is today. You know, I mean, I look at like how my mom raised me, and you know, even, you know, my wife and I, our parenting strategies are so much different, you know, now, and uh, and so uh, you know, there was uh, a lot of. Uh, a lot of abuse and, and you know yelling and things like that going on and you know so things that you would I mean I guess you do still see that today to some extent but it's you know th there are different uh, techniques now to raising kids um, but you know my grandparents did the best they could and uh, I think for what they had they you know uh, they they were certainly proud of him for you know what uh, what uh, led, you know what he was able to accomplish. You know that. So, uh, well, the family sisters. basically, yeah, is uh, consists of uh, there was they had the five children, uh, and then there was uh, so there was three uh, three sisters, uh, two of whom are still living um, here in the L.A. Area. And then uh, there's a handful of grandkids, probably I guess about uh, twelve or thirteen. So, um, but everybody pretty much um, is in California. A couple of them relocated to the East Coast, but mo most everybody's out here. Um, um, yeah, so, but it, it was uh, kind of, uh, uh, I, I know when, when my dad, you know, when his whereabouts became kind of uh, unknown, uh, if you will, and kind of questionable, as, as I'm going back to the early uh, mid-70s, I guess, um, you know, my grandparents were very, uh, very torn up about it, and, you know, it was kind of a big deal for them. They really couldn't quite, I, I don't think they ever really came to grips with it, you know, with it. but, uh, yeah. There's a letter that that I have that says, Dear Cholo, can we put that on? No, is it Chooch or Chooch. Cholo? No, Chooch is the postcard. Okay. See, I know this. <laughs> Chooch is the postcard and, and uh, Cholo is the, uh, the letter. So you're named after Federico Garcia Lorca. Oh, this is a. And this is his yeah. poem, which appears in, as a reference to in Brown Buffalo, where he says, I take the green death into me. And Lorca wrote a poem about death and with the color green. Verde que te quiero ver de verdes flowers. Ah. These are classic lines, and uh, they're invoked by your father in, uh, in Brown Buffalo, and I always said, this is an influence and now, since you're named after Federico Garcia Lorca, obviously, yes, you read uh, a lot. It, uh, at the beginning, when the book was published, a lot of people didn't give credit for it. They thought it was just kind of a spontaneous writing, but if you go back and read it, well, there's a intentionality in the things that he wants to do with Ernest Hemingway that you saw also. Federico Garcia Lorca uh, uh, and, and you know, Thompson later on. So. Right. Yeah. But there's a one that says, uh, Dear Cholo and Goya, of course, too. Well, you know, and I think that was actually, uh, I have to uh, 
I give a lot of credit to my mother uh -huh. for the, because she, she was. Uh, so here's one. No? Ah, okay. Church, if you go back. Then. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. Sure, I remember. And then this yeah. one, uh, this is the one you gave me, and this is about Dear Cholo <clears throat> that I have gone to Los Angeles and now I'm becoming a Chicano. Which oh is yeah, an yeah. Interesting a job, uh, right. moment because all of us were becoming Chicanos at that at that time. And he tells you, you know, that he's working for Cesar Chavez, and then he tells you, uh, learn Spanish and you can be a Chicano. A Chicano, too, if you want, as he says. Yeah. Could you uh, recall those moments uh, with your father? Obviously, a lot of caring no, that was directed your way to write you this, and uh, maybe your mom collected them, or you, I don't know. But uh, it gives us an insight into the writer and his relationship to his son. Well, he, yeah. he um, uh, uh, wrote uh, quite a bit, uh, letters and, uh, and you know, poems, short stories, and so I've, you know, I've, I've tried to keep uh, all these things uh, organized, and, uh, um, but I remember getting uh, quite a few letters from him. Uh, you know, he would, uh, work, like when he went to live in Aspen, Colorado, at one point, uh, you know, he, was, he, he would write me uh, Frequently, and, uh -huh. um, and that tends to be how we uh, communicate. Um, he, I have a, a whole stack of letters that they're, they're in the Santa Barbara collection of, uh, of love letters that he wrote to my to my mother, and uh, you don't see a lot of that these days. You know, I mean, I, I guess you know you could do emails and and you know uh, there's different uh, texting and right. however we do it now, but uh, you know this is from that era where people wrote. An actual letter, you know, uh -huh. and, and and these were like bona fide love letters. You know, they would just go on and on. I mean, you may have seen some of these, but um, uh -huh. but they're really quite interesting, um, and, and really show a lot of uh, uh, of his, you know his character. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I I remember uh, you know this all this quite well. I mean, I was about uh, this is early '70s, and uh, you know I was born in '59, so 1959, um, and so uh, I. I uh, we we stayed in touch frequently, and uh, he he would always, um, you know, his thing was like uh, he was very driven uh, in, in his work, and so even though uh, I think he you know we we, we he really uh, uh, was very uh, 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 connected to me, and you know we had a, a good bond. Um, and, you know, I, I, I always felt that my dad really loved me. You know, I, I, I didn't have any, really any issue with that, and I guess you might say, but, uh, but I always knew that, he, that his, one of his primary focuses was his work, you know, mm -hmm. and because uh, he was just always talking about it. And, you know, you can kind of get a sense for that from this letter, you know, here where he's, you know, talking about going to a new place and becoming, you know, part of a, a movement and, uh -huh. and getting involved in the, in the politics and stuff. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, I I I, uh, uh, I I have a lot of uh, uh, you know fond memories of, of and, I, and I live with him um, off and on uh, down here yeah. during during some of that time yeah. period. Uh, so this was when he came to Los Angeles, when I began to know this public figure that was Oscar Seta Costa because he was part of the blowouts in East LA, you know, South Gasto, who just passed away recently. So one responsible for those for those blowouts and the first large meetings of Chicanos, not so much Chicanos, but Chicanos here at the, the Grand Ballroom was the first time I saw your dad. And it was the first meeting of Chicanos of 1967-1968. Uh, certainly the movement began in 65, but it didn't become the identity issue that it began to be 67, 68, 69 about saying, I am a Chicano. That's how I met and saw your dad here at the grand at the grand ballroom, and then at the sports arena, which does that exist still? Sports arena, uh, you know, next to USC, was a rally that was had by uh, Mexican Americans and some Chicanos, no, who were in the Chicano movement, uh, uh, to raise funds for the uh, politicians who would be running, no, uh, uh, in some way representing the Mexican community of, of Los Angeles. Uh, uh, with Anthony Quinn, who was Mexican, but everybody didn't know that until he came. It was the time of coming out yeah. as Mexican for uh, for Mex for film people. 
So Anthony Quinn came out, you know, and I'm a Mexican from Chihuahua, you know, and all that. And then your father, they put the spotlight on him, which appears in cockroach, cockroach people, that they put the spotlight on him because he was running for sheriff of LA County under the Raza Unida Party, which was a party that began in Crystal City, Texas. It's the way that Mexicans began to uh, mobilize or organize themselves in terms of taking over the local elections, you know, like the, the sheriff or the, the school board or whatever, or mayor. Uh, but that that's when I uh, saw your father as a, as a public figure. I didn't know until much, much later that he was a writer, a writer too. And you did you come to L.A. in those days with um, your dad? Did you stay with him? I, I, I came down uh, uh, frequently. I, uh, I had some, uh, as I said earlier, some aunts that still live here. Um, and so my mother lived in San Francisco. So I lived, I spent most, most of the time with her. But uh, my dad always wanted me to come and, you know, be with him. And, uh, you know, it was always this kind of going back and forth thing between him and my mom. And, you know, and, and she would get a little, you know, nervous about because she knew you know kind of what his activities were and, and such but uh, you know uh, she knew that that you know he wanted me to be with him and so it was never a problem but uh, but yeah I, I, I was here uh, off and on and I I, uh, I remember a couple of years I enrolled in the local schools you know for uh, like I, I went to a lot of elementary schools I probably went to about I'd say at least 10 elementary schools um, you know because we I went to some in San Francisco, and then over in the East Bay, and then when I lived with him down here, um, and uh, back in Colorado for uh, a brief period of time. But uh, uh, I, I, this, yeah, I, I spent uh, a fair amount of time down here. Yeah. You were telling me that you were on campus at one time because uh, Acosta's second wife. Right, so Coro, uh <laughs> is, uh, uh, I don't know if she's, I can't remember if she's referred to in any of his uh, books. I, I think in the introduction. Right, yeah. right, yeah, that's right, in the introduction she is, right, right. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that she was a student here at UCLA. And uh, uh, I guess I was, I, that was probably the last time I, that I was, yeah, that I was here at, UC, at UCLA. But, uh -huh. um, but I, you know, I, I, I remember, this point about his, uh, you know, connection to his work was, uh, always fascinating to me and I, you know when I was a kid I, I just I didn't really uh, uh, I was kind of quiet and uh, somewhat shy and um, you know he he was just kind of overpowering in many ways and uh, you know always around these uh, you know high profile types and, mm -hmm. you know political people and, and other people in the arts and so on and so forth but uh, um, but uh, you know he, he, he was always very direct and um, just uh, kind of you know, said how it was, and, uh, but but during that time period, you know, it was I never felt like my own personal safety was you know that was at risk. I mean, I always felt safe enough, but um, you know, I, I can think I can remember a couple times though where he was he would always not always, but he 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 would be honest about what was going on and say, look, you know, I'm 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 involved with these. You know a lot of uh, a lot of uh, political uh, activities down here, and it's you know a lot of us are not really that popular, and uh, you know you have to be prepared for you know something to happen, and so you know and you know the the, the, the police are you know we, we they don't necessarily like us and, or a lot of us, and so you know I, I, I remember that, but that, I, I never you know felt like uh, you know I, I had to look over my shoulder or anything. There's a letter that he wrote to. His parents, your grandparents, about leaving San Francisco and after coming through a, a depression and then heading out to uh, Colorado. Uh, you gave me all this stuff, by the way. You, yeah, no, I, I recognize all of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, this one. Yeah. And this uh, describes, you know, what he was going through in San Francisco and telling your parents know that the fire was beginning to consume me, or, or that I have been I've been at war with God and the world since when I don't remember. You know, this is who I am, and uh, I'm writing to you from Colorado because I had to leave. And I assume he was working uh, as an attorney uh, at that time. Not 
Exactly, but go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll... Uh, and then uh, apparently that's the that's when he met Hunter. I'm not sure. But could you tell us something? If you know anything about this period where he decides I'm leaving San Francisco and well, going to Colorado. <clears throat> What happened was, um, actually, he was um, not working as an attorney in Colorado. He was working as a dishwasher, uh -huh. and uh, of, of all things. But uh, he, he kind of just wanted to get away from everything. Uh, he had been working as a, uh, uh, basically uh, doing uh, landlord-tenant, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, cases for uh, low-income uh, clients in, in uh, the Bay Area. And um, so he just wanted to get up and go and get away from it. And so um, the, he, he got in his car and, and drove out to uh, Colorado. Um, he, um, he, he got a, there, there was a contact that, I, get, I can't remember exactly who it was, but somebody that had you know, given, given him a contact and, and, then, and then that's how he hooked up with Hunter and, uh, when he got to Aspen. And uh, they just kind of you know, became uh, you know, pretty close after that, um, but uh, he 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 was there for I guess about six months. Um, uh -huh. But he wasn't you know he wasn't doing anything political like like you know like Corky Gonzalez for example right. in Denver and you know all that uh, thing. He he wasn't really part of any of that. You know, uh, I mean now, now now this keep in mind this is before he went out to L.A. Right. So he you know he he was just he was still trying to find his you know his place and. and um, he, uh, as I said, he, 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 he didn't necessarily give up practicing law, but uh, he, you know, he didn't become licensed to practice in Colorado or anything like that. He just um, wanted to get away from everything. So he, you know, he found it, had a little, uh, got a little apartment there and, um, and uh, was there for, as I said, for I guess about a year or so. And, uh, but, but I, I, again, I, you know, I, I, uh, he wanted me to come out there and, uh, and uh, join him. And the way that he um, asked me to do that was, it was a little unusual, <laughs> and I, I'll never forget, I, I was going to elementary school in San Francisco at the time, and I guess, what, third, second grade, second or third grade, and um, so uh, I knew that he had, was in, in uh, Colorado, because I'd you know, been talking to him, with the letters and stuff, and so one day, right before class, I'm out in the, in the, in the playground, you know, with some of my friends, and all of a sudden he walks up, and I hadn't seen him in like five or six months, and I, I almost just fell over. I was like, oh my God, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so he, he came up and said, well, I want you to come to Colorado with me. And then, and I was like, well, okay, but you know, I was like, you think, think mom will, you know, my mom will mine and whatever, and so, he, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So, uh, so we, we, you know, now, now keep in mind, this is, you know, for a parent to just, Come and you know take their kid from school like that. The the, the teacher and the principal they had you know they, they were just uh, they, they, it was a uh, uh, they, they were very very upset. And um, but uh, he just said, well I'm taking him. And so anyway, uh, he took me and uh, we talked with my mom. You know and, and uh, eventually within two or three days we came you know came to an agreement and uh, and then I ended up going back there with him for about four or five months. But um, but yeah, he wasn't doing any. Uh, he, he was just working as a, I think, doing construction jobs, and then he had a, a job as a dishwasher, and and uh, and, uh, and that's when he just his relationship with Hunter had just started. So. So you met uh, Hunter when you went to Colorado, and you knew about their friendship. Uh, well, that yeah, that would have been the first time. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he lived in a little place right outside of Aspen, called Woody Creek. And uh, his uh, widow <coughs> um, still lives there to this day. Um, it's a very beautiful place, you know, house with a view of the mountains. And so, anyway, uh, but yeah, they they they, uh, they spent a lot of time there together, and you know, developed a relationship. And, um, there, there's quite a few letters, by the way. I, I you know if anybody's come across them, but you may have seen some of them. But uh, they exchanged quite a few uh, letters. Um, Hunter was very prolific, uh, and my dad uh, also, you know, as I said, you know, letter wrote, uh, wrote, you know, uh, tons of letters. Uh -huh. But they had a little thing going, you know, they they would, uh, you know, exchange uh, letters frequently. And those letters are Hunter. Uh, well, those now the interesting thing about that is um, those letters are 
Uh, some of them were published in one of Hunter's books that came out um, a few years before he committed suicide, um, a few years back. Um, and I, I can't remember the, the volume, but it's uh, um, right before he died, I'd say maybe within the, you know, six, seven, eight years before he had been releasing, a, I think there's maybe two or three books all together, uh, and, and they're essentially collections of letters and, 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 and such. And, uh, so in this particular one, uh, what he did was he went through his basement, um, and in his basement he had just, you know, it's just like this, he just had tons of boxes of materials. And uh, there was a, a lot of stuff uh, from the, uh, uh, you know, from his lifetime, but uh, a, a including his uh, letters that he had uh, with the exchange with my dad. And so um, all of those, uh, some of them were released and as part of this collection. And so, you know, those are available. Um, and then um, I guess there's a few that I have that may be down in Santa Barbara, but the, uh, the rest of them, and I actually haven't seen all of them because when he, uh, when he passed away, um, there, there was, a, a, I guess, a, a trustee that kind of manages, you know, the, the estate. And so um, his wife, his widow, told me, though, that, uh, that, uh, that Depp, the Johnny Depp, purchased all of these materials. Oh. And so somehow he owns all of the, you know, the, uh, these letters. And I, so I don't know where, where in the heck they are. They're probably some, I think they're in some, you know, place down here in L.A. And, uh -huh. uh, but it would be, uh, it'd be interesting to, you know, go through those. Sure. At some point. Okay. And uh, did you know Hunter was a writer? You knew all those things about him as a little boy. You know? uh, well, uh, I uh, I did. I, I I think at that time he had just written uh, Hell's Angels, uh -huh. and so that's really kind of what put him on the map. And uh, and so I remember, you know, I I I, uh, I looked through the book. Uh, I don't know if I really understood it completely, but. Uh -huh. uh, because I was, what, I guess six or seven. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, but, but that had just come out, and so I, I knew that he was a writer. And, um, but uh, so, and then of course, you know, he, that, that was actually before a lot of, well, he, he was, that put him on the map, but then I think it was some of his later writings that, you know, are probably right. more, yeah. Yeah. he's more well known for. But. Yeah. <clears throat> also, uh, I have a letter from uh, your dad when he's in the hospital. USC, at the John Wesley Hospital. Uh, uh, no, you mean, is this? This is 1970. Oh, okay. 73. Yep. Uh, but, uh, and it also has the uh, chapter by chapter uh, synopsis of the third book that your dad was going to, to write. And he wrote that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like, just in case. So he had all this stuff. And then the last will and testament, in which he gives everything to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe easy or not easy. Can you recall what was uh, um, troubling your dad in the 73? Uh, you know, well, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, uh, it, it seems like, um, he was um, he was getting burnt out. You know, he was just kind of. Um, I mean, it, it, it was really intense for him. You know, uh -huh. being down here and, and just uh, I, I know from my own practice of law. You know, it's not necessarily a field I'd recommend uh, anybody go into. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm I'm grateful for what I have, and you know, I, I'm 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 happy to do it and help clients, and you know. Uh, uh, you know, I appreciate it, but uh, it, it can be, um, uh, you know, dealing with uh, people uh, intimately on, on issues that are very uh, 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 important to them um, and part of their personal life. It, it can be, you know, really emotionally uh, draining to a person. And I don't know, I think that's probably what happened, you know, to him at that point. Um, I know he, he ended up in the hospital for a while, and, you know, he was just kind of having like a, you know, just, I guess, I don't, I don't really actually know exactly, I don't, I don't think I visited him, but he probably just like stress and anxiety. And, um, you know, he, he, he did have some problems with his, uh, uh, with ulcers and stomach, you know, issues. But, um, 
Mm-hmm. So that I, I, you know, I, I think that's probably what was yeah. what was going on. Um, and, and you know that piece that you were talking about, um, yeah, this one right here. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, you know, um, that's January '74. Uh-huh. Um, that was, essentially was a will that he, uh, 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 what we call a holographic will or a handwritten will, um, and uh, I. I think this probably is significant in the sense that um, he, uh, yeah, I think he kind of knew that eventually something, you know, was going to happen to him, that he was, you know, somebody was going to assassinate him or, um, you know, he was going to, uh, just, you know, it's going to be foul place somehow, you know, some, whether it was, a, you know, one, a rival um, a political person or, um, somebody from law enforcement or, you know, the police or, you know, who knows. But, um, you know, so he, because he, as I said, you know, he, he made reference to this um, to me, you know, frequently. And I, I remember in, in when I traveled with him in Mexico a couple times and, you know, he uh, brought this up, you know, like, you know, you have to be ready because, you know, something might happen and, you know, so, so that's why this will here is just kind of like, you know, getting prepared for that. And, um, I don't really, no, nobody really has any concrete evidence as to exactly what happened to him, but, um, you know, I, I think the consensus, if you probably looked at all the resources, all the material, all the, 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 the articles, the, you know, mm-hmm. that it's out there, is that, is that he was, uh, was killed by a, uh, basically, um, uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, I, I guess the best way to uh, consider it would be a rival, uh, uh, drug, you know, uh, person, you know, yeah. somebody they were just, you know, got kind of got mixed up with uh, some of these folks in uh, in Mexico, and that's, you know, what I understand. But uh, I really, honestly, don't know. I, I, I you know, um, I know there was a <clears throat> there was a there's a couple of people up in the Bay Area that I've talked to over the years, and um, they were down there with him, you know, around this this time period. So mm-hmm. this is when he wrote that will. Okay. That was just right before he went down to Mexico for the last time, mm-hmm. and so um, the so last time I ever heard from him it was was just shortly after this, and it would have been I guess seventy, yeah, or mid seventy four approximately, and 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 and, and uh, you know so as I said, uh, according to these uh, individuals that I talked to, they were you know they were down there and it, it's some some part of northern Mexico and just you know. Uh, got into arguments and one thing led to another and, you know, he just ended up getting uh, assassinated or killed. But, you know, I, I don't have any, like, um, corroborating uh, evidence. It's just kind of like hearsay, but uh, it seems to be from a pretty reliable source. Um, you know, I, I, the, this this man that I've talked to, you know, he was down, he was he was actually with him and, and I, I've known him for, you know, for most of my life. and. Uh, but he didn't actually witness anything. Uh, but that's what uh, he suggested uh, probably happened. And, uh, you know, so anyway, I think that was. And I think what, back when we first met, you told me you were the last one to hear from him or to receive a message from him? Or? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, um, uh-huh. I, I th- at least as far as the immediate circle of people, uh-huh. the, 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 you know, the family and uh, close friends, I don't. I'm not aware of anybody else that had any um, contact with him after that last uh, telephone call that I had, mm-hmm. you know, from him. Because I actually got a phone call from him, uh-huh. you know, when he was down, and he was in uh, Masaman. Uh-huh. And, and he called that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can remember it as if it happened yesterday. He was uh, <clears throat> he was in Masaman, and uh, this is something that I probably wouldn't uh, necessarily share uh, to the public if it had been, you know, like maybe a year or two after it actually happened. Uh-huh. But, you know, I was really young back then, so it really didn't matter. But, and, and, you know, it doesn't matter now because I really don't, you know, I mean, ages ago. But, <laughs> um, uh, he, he uh, had, as I said, been living in Masaban. He was, uh, you know, he was, um, it, it, he was still writing. Um, he wasn't really practicing anymore. He'd given up, you know, a lot of his active cases. And, um, and he was just involved with uh, with uh, narcotics type people, and you know, uh, 
I don't really know exactly what their plans were or what you know they had in mind, but uh, I, I, but he did tell me that he, he called because he wanted to you know he wanted to talk to me and he wanted to say that he was he was going to be getting on a boat to come up to the Bay Area uh, from Mazatlan, and um, and so um, I, I asked him uh, well, what you know what are you doing I mean what's what's going on down there um, and. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I've got a boatload of stuff. We're going to bring it up, and we're going to make a bunch of money when I get up to the Bay Area. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and my mom was in the other room. You know, she, she kind of knew, you know, hear the conversation. And, um, and so and I just said, well, okay, you know, just be careful, and, you know, I'll see you when you get up here. And, and, uh, and, and then he just said, like, well, okay, you know, you take care of yourself, too, and you be careful, too, and, you know, uh, um, and, um, and I'll see you in a few weeks. And uh, and then and that was it. And so uh, you know, I, I, it appeared to me that he was coming up here, you know, with some with some friends on a boat, and they were gonna, you know, try to sell some stuff to make money. I, you know, I didn't really have any other information, and and that was it. And so nobody else, you know, heard uh, after that. Yeah, this was in April, I think. That you said. This would have been uh, yeah, the spring of '74, uh, I believe. And so we were kind of expecting him to come into Santa Cruz, um, you know, a month or two later, and you know, nobody ever, you know, ever found out what happened after. Now that piece that you just showed earlier, um, the um, this no, is that the, did you have that up there? Um, Thompson wrote a, uh, a you might call it an unofficial obituary, mm -hmm. and so there's an article that, that uh, where he, you know. Uh, elaborates on uh, his theory as to what um, may have happened, but uh, uh -huh. it's you know kind of uh, similar. Yeah. So that's the article for the Rolling Stone, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The tenth anniversary. Issue. Issue. That was a cover story. Not not a cover story, but it was on the cover. Right. So um, you know he he had uh, talked to a number of right. folks and you know came up with his theories. And, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Hunter wrote uh, "Strange Rumblings in Aslan," first political article in Rolling Stone magazine uh, when it started back in 67. Uh, I think they're getting back to doing more interesting issues and articles that they went through an 80s, 90s thing about just being fluff in some ways, and so now they're getting, they're getting back to it. But, um, and I think these two books are the only, in my mind, I would say, interesting important books that Rolling Stone published you know, and that have they have had a longevity now since being taken up by vintage books you know, and now probably sold forever you know, but they will be yeah. selling forever but do you know you have any idea how he got to Rolling Stone and did he do, did he know John uh, Wenner or, or um, he? well he got to he got to Rolling Stone through Hunter essentially uh -huh. uh, because Hunter's uh, uh, Pieces had been um, uh, uh, appearing in Rolling Stone, and um, so when he, when when my dad, you know, started writing, uh, well, he had a number of things that he had already written, you know, some short stories and stuff. But uh, then when he wrote these, or the first book, the Cockroach People, um, he uh, Hunter essentially gave him an introduction to, you know, to the uh, company, to the to the owner, to Winter. Um, at the time, it was a it was the, the Printing uh, division was Straight Arrow Press, right. and so that's who published the the, the first one. The first uh, the little boy slide scout. you had up here. The little boy scout. The little boy scout, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. That was Straight Arrow Press, and so uh, they they had a number of authors. Um, I don't remember all of them, but uh, but uh, they did uh, um, uh, agree to publish. Um, they gave them a contract for um, both of those. Uh -huh. uh, both of those books for each, you know, for each one, uh -huh. and um, they initially published. I, I think it was about uh, it's about five thousand copies, I, I believe, for each one, mm -hmm. and they're hardcover editions. And then they did some paperbacks also, um, and then they essentially went out of business. I mean, Rolling Stone didn't, but the the, the he got Jan basically decided to close down the publishing division. So, yeah, and when I met you, you were just going to receive right the plates from Rolling Stone, or oh, uh, yeah, he well, he had the manuscripts, 
and uh, I think I, I yeah I got those um, uh, from him at one point. Unfortunately, I don't have them anymore. Um, it's uh, one of these weird family things where you know my aunt uh, got into a, a dispute and then just I, I think inadvertently threw out the you know the box something like that. But uh, those are the, the the actual manuscripts for uh -huh. both of these. So. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have those, but but they did get republished, so you know, and that's the current edition. That's, right. That's you know vintage. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, your dad had tried for some years to publish with an Eastern publisher, and it's interesting that vintage books then in '89 picks up them uh, and publishes the two books. Right. right. Uh, yeah. He, uh, you know, I, I now that I'm not, uh, I, I don't know a lot of the details about. His, uh, the, the early publishing efforts. Um, I just remember he got, you know, got uh, hooked up with um, with uh, vintage or with uh, Straight Arrow. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then you contacted vintage. Uh, well, I did, yeah, because um, I, they were basically out of print, and so uh, you know, I just figured that uh, they they should be back in print, and um, and so it took a while. Though. It took me a, a two or three years of. You know, I, I just, I remember sending out these letters to, you know, I mean, I, I went to all kinds, I must have gone to about 50 or 60 different uh, printing, you know, places. You know, and, and at that time, you know, to some extent, it's still like that today, but uh, I mean, everything now is, you know, publishing online and such, but uh, there wasn't any, anything like that back then, obviously. And so, you know, you'd have to, um, you'd have to try to get an agent or get a, uh, um, an editor at uh, one of the publishers to, you know, pick up your stuff, but um, I went to a lot of people. I, I, I went to a lot of uh, like uh, uh, academic presses, and um, I think I went to Stanford. You know, at one, at one point. Yeah, I wrote the letter. For Stanford. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish it had been. It, you know, yeah. it was a good letter, as I, I recall. Know, but they didn't. They, they decided not to. They just they they passed on it. But yeah, uh, the senior editor asked me to write the letter because she read. That's right. Because, That's right. Because yeah. Of the conference I right. had, she read right. the books, and I said, "Yeah, you should do it." Well, I don't know how I got. Uh, uh, but I have the letter, you know, that I that I wrote. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And we corresponded back and forth and said, you know, this is Stanford you know, is interested, but didn't. Right. Publish. Right. Yeah. Ultimately, they decided not to. Yeah. But uh, but then for some somehow the the I, I don't even remember how I got to uh -huh. vintage Random House, but they they thought it would be a you know a good. Uh, addition to their collection sure, so sure. yeah. and, and you asked Hunter to do the introduction or how did that happen uh, yeah well I did um, and he agreed uh -huh. um, but um, the editor was initially not uh, really happy because he uh, it was kind of tongue-in-cheek but he's you know he, he I remember he, he told me he said look at you know tell your uh, um, tell the editor that I want forty seven thousand dollars for the introduction and, and, I, and so I, I told I, I remember writing the, uh, the letter. yeah to the editor and I said well you know he's going to do it but he wants forty seven thousand so can you come up with it and and she just like she was really pissed and yeah. you know said how dare he and this and that and so but uh, in any way in any event they eventually you know worked it out with his agent and I don't think he, he didn't get forty seven thousand dollars you know yeah, pro sure. probably didn't even get more than I don't know a couple thousand you know for for the intro. <laughs> 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 and then the afterword, which is a very personal message you know, to, yeah, well to that, the reader you know, about your relationship to your father, right? Well, that, that was, yeah, that was the uh, editor. Um, um, uh, I forget her name. Uh, I don't think she's still there, but uh, she was the one that suggested that. And, uh, you know, it seemed, seemed to make sense, uh, you know, under the circumstances. So I went ahead and did that. And, yeah, it's, it's been uh, you know quite interesting though to, to watch, uh, as I said earlier, you know the how they uh, fit into the uh, this development of this uh, body of literature, and you know it's quite fascinating. I don't pretend to know really much about it. I I, mean, I, I see these you know from once every once in a while I get a copy of a you know a dissertation from uh, some uh, PhD candidate and and they're like you know well they want to uh, you know and then they're talking you know. It's all Greek to me. I don't you know. They're talking all this literary theory, <laughs> right. so, but uh, I, you know, there's obviously a lot of uh, material in there that you know. Yeah, still today, uh, it's still current and still, you know, in some way part of uh, 
not just uh, Chicana Chicano studies and those that literature, but also American studies. When I taught back east, uh, it was a, of interest from American studies people. And, and uh, Joel Simon, who was my student back east, is the one who led me to you. And Joel Simon was not Chicano or Mexicano, but he was very much interested in your your father's books, and so I. I was his uh, whatever mentor, you know, for his senior thesis uh, back east. Uh, so it fits in there now, as well as in within Chicana Chicano literature to think of it at what moment in time, no, uh, with the Chicano movement, which is of course an important movement nationwide. It may have been local, but when you think now of the history up to to 2013, there was an important moment in in American culture. And then when you think of Brown Buffalo, well, that's you know 1967, the summer of yeah. love, all those things. And then your father was in a sense uh, doing his thing with that, the drug trips, you know, love, all that stuff, sex, uh, but doing it from a Mexican, you know, American, yeah. Chicano perspective. Right? He, he was yeah, kind of uh, uh, you know s separate himself to some extent. You uh -huh. know, I think from the uh, he wasn't really like you know kind of a part of the hippie scene and right. you know necessarily I mean he he, he was uh, that just really wasn't his uh, his character you know uh -huh. he was like I said earlier you know very very driven and motivated and like to stay active and busy and and you know just kind of uh, you know uh, sitting around uh -huh. getting high all the time it's just not really uh, I don't know he, he was just way too active for that uh -huh. but um, I mean not that all hippies did that or do that but uh, I'm stereotyping to some extent but right. uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, I, 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 I think uh, that uh, you know some of these uh, these uh, these books they're they're they are local, but uh, they, there is a crossover, you know, because. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know a lot of that has to do with his identity you know his identifying with like when he married my mom right. you know a white girl and you know just like kind of like was part of, felt like part of that culture but then you know he also knew that he was had grown up in you know the Vadio and you know and then and, and, uh, Riverbank and you know uh, so there was a lot of you know he was very conflicted I, I guess you might say today yeah. um, uh. Did Hunter and your dad have a falling out, or did? did um, I, I don't think they had a falling out. They yeah. just were two very volatile personalities, and uh, you know, uh, they had big egos, and uh, they were both writers, and they um, were uh, very driven and opinionated. Uh -huh. um, so I don't think there was any falling out. Or say I wouldn't say it was a falling out. I mean, they just you know um, they probably would. I, I imagine have you know continued some some type of relationship right. if, if my dad not uh, you know um, uh, you know left. But uh, yes, yeah, so I, I I don't think. I mean, he he had some uh, issues with uh, one of the publishers, as I recall, because the publisher of the proposed publisher publisher of uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas didn't want to initially publish the book because they were fearing a libel lawsuit from my father. Oh. Um, now, it's not, you know, that was uh, understandable given that they were, you know, basically saying that this, you know, living practicing attorney is, you know, is a drug crazed uh, Samoan and so on and so forth. And, right. you know, True or not, it was close enough to reality that they, you know, the, the attorneys I remember at the time, you know, were at advice against it, and so they, you know, they they they, they came up with this plan of, um, you know, uh, where they they um, the, essentially they asked him to sign a release, and so that's what he did, you know, just like the release I signed earlier today, <laughs> so, you know, that's just, that's exactly what they did, and, you know, he, but but. There was some negotiations, though, uh, and um, uh, the, what happened was he, they, um, uh, in exchange for the release, he wanted he asked them um, to uh, include a picture, uh, which you actually had up here earlier, the one of uh, with Hunter the black glove. with the black glove, and um, <clears throat> so they wanted my dad asked that that be uh, part of the deal, 
that that photograph be included on the jacket cover um, of the book uh, to uh, make it clear that uh, you know that, that, that uh, as to who he was and that you know he was not you know necessarily some Samoan you know guy and you know whatever this one right here uh -huh. and so um, uh, with that uh, he signed a release um, looking back on it it's uh, very interesting because uh, I don't uh, know if he had not signed it uh, I don't know what would have happened I don't know if that book ever would have been published quite frankly and it it may have been published and the, the publishers might have said well we'll just take a chance and see if uh, Costa sues us um, I, I don't, and I don't even know if my dad would have sued them. I, I, I really don't. You know, he was so unpredictable. I mean, you know, he certainly had grounds, would have had grounds to, uh, but, uh, um, but, but it's not really. That's just not how it went down. I think also there was a part of the deal. Um, I don't know if it was actually in the release, but uh, basically Hunter was said, look, you know, let's just get this thing over with, so you know I can publish this thing. And uh, you know, I'll give you a connection to, to Jan, and you know, we can get some of your stuff published. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you know. I think that was part of the negotiations, also. But uh, there's a, there's kind of a like a little minor controversy about the authorship of the Vegas book. Um, now, you know, I, I don't really, I don't know if any. It's really not a, probably not a big deal, but I know some some. Uh, there, there's some people that I've talked to that uh, have, have suggested that that, uh, that that both of them actually wrote it, and that uh, that they, you know, they both should have gotten credit for it. And uh, uh, I remember one time, my one of my my dad's sisters, who's still living down here today in Los Angeles, uh, that's going back about 15 years, but uh, you know, she uh, she said, look, at, you know, I want to I want to go back and I want to tell Hunter, I want him to tell me to my, to my face. Um, you know what really went down as far as the authorship of this book. <clears throat> so I said, okay, well, let, let me call him. So I, I arranged for us to go back there, and uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, have her come, you know, come on back. So we went back, and uh, this is like in the early '90s. Stayed there for about two or three days, and um, and uh, they had a, a, a quite an extensive talk about this, and. Uh, I wasn't present at the actual when they were talking because I was in the other room, do, you know, talking with somebody else. But uh, she told me afterwards that you know they had talked about it, and, uh, and 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 I think in so many words he suggested that that my dad had uh, had had uh, was responsible for for some you know part of it, and you know, I don't know how much or uh, you know to what extent. But uh, anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting, um, and. Um, you know, but that's kind of uh, just uh, water under the bridge at this point. Because well, uh, the Samoan drives the book. Without the Samoan, there is no fear of building in Las Vegas. Um, I've seen this uh, uh, photo on the internet, but your father has been taken out, so it's just it's just Hunter. Uh, do you know why someone wanted to do that, or? Uh. There's no significance. I, you know, I, 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 the best I, I can recall is that I mean that that was uh, they were actually there at that particular hotel. I mean I remember that. Uh -huh. So that's that's an actual photograph. Uh, uh -huh. it, it's it's it, it actually took place. Uh -huh. I wasn't there, but I you know I remember talking with him when he was down. Uh -huh. So I don't have any reason to believe that it was you know manufactured or uh -huh. you know, the, the, the photograph itself. So. Um, uh -huh. Because they, they were actually there together, you know. Sure. I mean, that, that's historical fact. Right. Yeah. So. There is some uh, manuscript you know, that I have read that I have, I think, you know, where your dad says, you know, that all the credit that has gone to Hunter for the Gonzo journalism should be mine. Should be mine too. Do you know about that? You know, like I said before, you know, writers typically uh, have big egos, and uh, it's probably with good reason. That's why they, you know, write things that uh, are interesting and that we all like to read. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think I I, I, <laughs> I I don't really know. I I, I would say possibly, but uh, uh, you know, uh, hey, you know, if, if I suppose if my dad were living t today, if he came back 
and we had a discussion about this, I, I, I would say, well, you know, you didn't have to sign the release. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't have signed it. But, <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I, I think that, but you know, the, the, one of the things I, I was going to say is I, I think uh, it, it's good to, to see that his works are recognized because I, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of folks, they just kind of, um, the, the, you know, he's linked up with this uh, Thompson writer and, and, you know, there's some interesting things, I suppose, in that regard, but, um, you know, he's also, uh, uh, was, uh, I think, a, a very fine writer, you know, in his own right. Um, uh, the the uh, the hometown, uh, incidentally, uh, where he uh, spent where, where he spent a lot of time, uh, Riverbank, they evidently uh, just in the last couple of months are setting up a collection of his materials in their local li you know local library. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting because a lot of the people there in that uh, town don't really you know they, they don't really know about a lot of his uh, you know his writings or you know what he did. And so. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a film, as I said, that I've seen of you. You took me to Anne Henry's house. Anne Henry, right? Anne Henry, right. Anne Henry in uh, San Francisco. And the film is uh, your dad reading uh, Brown Buffalo, the year, I think, on this side. And then the owl. Mm -hmm. the other, her husband. Her right. husband is over here. And uh, I think they're high and they're drinking and they're having a good time. Did you talk about drugs or anything like that with your dad? I, mean, uh, I think someone would die if Brown Buffalo if you took all those drugs. You know, that's there. that's fiction. But you know, your dad also said he took LSD. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing about uh, with uh, you know drugs and and, uh, and Oscar was that um, you know he uh, he wasn't what I would call uh, like your modern day junkie. You know, somebody that's hooked. Uh, on drugs that has a clearly has a, a, a documented substance abuse uh, problem and that's going through treatment and uh, you know he, he wasn't to that point um, a lot of these things you know it was more of like this experimental you know with him and um, um, as far as LSD I mean you know everybody was doing that back then not well not everybody but you know people in the underground culture were right. certainly and I guess that's what I meant you know people sure. in that sure. and so but he never really I mean he uh, I mean he, he did it and yeah I, I don't I you know really can't give you like an estimate as to how many times but uh, I mean uh, I remember when he was when I was living down here in LA with him and you know he would uh, have his clients come over to the house and and be you know, uh, under the influence, and and you know, he would tell me what he was doing, and you know, show me exactly what it was, and and describe for me like the you know that it was a certain chemical that was you know he was doing to try to you know um, you know try to uh, help him uh, uh, you know reach some state of knowledge or you know whatever, and, you know. So that I mean, I, I remember that, uh, but I don't uh, think that he had a. Um, a, uh, like a hardcore drug problem. Um, now I know. I mean, you know, he. I, I know my dad. Uh, I mean, he he drank alcohol, but he wasn't like the kind of. Um, you know, he was just. Uh, he didn't really let it get in the way of his his his. Uh, you know, his his work. I mean, he, he was very disciplined. You know, he would. Uh, I remember. You know, when when you know writing a lot of these uh, stories and in, in these books. You know, he would wake up uh, typically very early in the morning and often swim, you know, do exercise, and then, you know, uh, uh, start uh, typing, and he would, like, work for, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, and uh, very, very methodical and uh, extremely disciplined. So, um, uh, you know, drugs, was I, I think it was just something that he was kind of experimenting with, in, in, in a sense, um, and uh, uh, that's, I don't know, that, that's kind of my, you know, my take on it, but... Um, uh, you know, it's. I mean, every every other writers. Uh, I, I I suppose they. You know, kind of uh, really, um, it consumes them, and uh, it. You know, it's part of their uh, writing, and uh, I don't know, it defines the writing somehow. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely there. Uh, right. You know, because that 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 time period, I think. Sure. Yeah. And this figure of the owl, uh, who is uh, Robert Henry, right? Correct. Uh, and 
and Henry, they're the, they're the couple, right? That's right. Yeah, uh, they were just friends. They, they were friends of his uh, that uh, he uh, had known from the San Francisco days. Uh -huh. Because in uh, Thomas's biography, Robert Henry appears uh, as a kind of a local drug dealer, something right, like that. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, that's what uh, I understand uh, happened. I think Thompson uh -huh. probably, you know, was able to get some of his, you know, material, okay. <laughs> okay. as I understand, you know, again, I, I, yeah, uh, and uh, Anne has passed away, right? No, no, they, uh, he uh, passed, passed away, away yeah. uh, but she's still living, yeah, she's still living in San Francisco, and so a lot of those characters uh, are, are, are still in the area, um, but, uh, uh, you know, a number of them have passed out. And I recall when I met you, you said that, the couple have been like your parents after the disappearance of your father. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they they, uh, they they knew him quite well. Um, he, um, of course, you will recall in the book, her she's the real life character for the lady named uh, referred to as uh, Alice. Right. And so, um, um, and and uh, so they were very close, all three of them, and he lived with them off and on and. Um, uh, so they, they got to know each other, you know, quite well, and uh, and kept up over the years. But um, I, I've kept up with them, you know, with the family, That's and uh, to this day, you know, I, I still have a close connection with them. So questions uh, from the audience about Brown Buffalo or about Acosta or Revolt. Somebody who have read the book. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 I guess I just asked, like, for the time that you guys were together, what, what was your relationship with him? Like, with, um, like, you said that you would spend, like, a lot of time apart, but when you were actually living with him and staying with him, um, like, how did you guys interact? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, to go back in my memory here. Um, I think we, well, you know, one of the things that I remember, I, I think about him, and it kind of sticks out, he, um, he always incorporated me into his life, you know, into his daily life. Um, and so, um, like if, for example, he was writing, um, you know, he would uh, tell me what he was writing, and and then uh, you know, often after he would read it, and you know, ask me to, what I thought about it, um, and uh, um, you know, so he, he was he we related a lot. You know, he, he was very uh, personal, and uh, you know, asked me a lot of questions, and um, but always like supported uh, my interests and. Uh, you know, I remember like he was a musician, and, and I had just started showing some interest in in music and guitars and stuff, and so you know he kind of encouraged that. And, um, but I would say you know he was very communicative. Um, um, he had a had a pretty good sense of humor, um, and uh, but he could be very uh, emotional too. You know, he he you know sometimes his temper would come out and. Um, uh, you know, if he if he thought uh, something wasn't right, you know, he would he would tell you, and and, and uh, whether it was like some you know on a political issue or you know something having to do with the family or, or really anything, uh, very you know outspoken, and he was always that way with me. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I you know I I, I I I would say I got to know my dad very. Pretty well, you know, under the circumstances. I mean, you know, I spent a fair amount of time with him. Um, but uh, I, the last I saw him was I was 14, so, you know, um, I don't know what, what our relationship would be like today. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I was wondering uh, if you also grew up with kind of a Chicano identity that he was also kind of developing as part, he was kind of part of the movement. Um, I was wondering if that kind of uh, trickled down to, to you as a child too, or wow, that um, yeah, that, that 
that uh, that 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 is a very good question. I I really don't know. Um, I I would say um, I was aware of it, but you know a lot of people at that time, you know, you would say Chicano, they would be like, what does that mean? You know, what is a Chicano? And maybe they're you know I guess people are still asking the question, but. Uh, you know, it's probably more defined now, and there's more uh, of, a, of a sense of you know what what it means, and and and. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I knew that he was identifying with his you know with his Mexican side, um, and so that was always uh, you know he, he he was pretty good about talking about that you know because you know, you can see from some of these letters you know uh, he he would. Uh, uh, and especially down here, you know, I remember when we lived down here, you know, the, 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 it was very big, you know, and the, all the little, little political slogans and the, you know, those little buttons that, you know, you'd get and uh, with the little slogans on them. And, and so, yeah, you know, it was, um, he, he talked about it a lot. And, but as far as, um, you know, what I identified with, you know, I, my mom was uh, basically a mix of uh, Welsh and, English, Irish, German, and uh, you know, so I had that side of the family, and so um, you know, I would always get her uh, two cents worth, you know, as to what uh, you know, kind of influenced by her side of it as well. Um, and uh, but uh, you know, I, as I recall, my, my mom was very supportive of those. That you know, she she because she knew that my dad had you know had, had this other uh, this this background and, and and where he was from, and and so you know, she always. Uh, was very um, supportive of my Mexican side, I guess, if you will. Um, you know, she very sensitive about it, and you know, knew that uh, a lot of the, the the discrimination that had taken place, and you know, so um, you know, she she definitely encouraged me to you know be uh, to to uh, identify with both you know both cultures really. It's not. I mean, it's kind of a mix. You know, it's. Um, I mean, everybody's really. Uh, we're all kind of a. A mix in some sense. Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know, it's yeah. not an really easy answer to it. <laughs> yeah. I guess I wonder how would the the voice of the actual person that you knew different from the voice that we read or that we hear in through the book? Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that, that that's fascinating to think about that. I. I uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, I haven't heard the actual voice. Obviously, it's been you know many many years. Um, the recordings that are out there now are basically include that one, the one we were talking about early, earlier, the Flory Canto uh, uh, at USC, at USC, where he's reading from the Cockroach people. Um, uh, that you know, it's kind of interesting to to hear his accent because. Um, uh, I, I, I guess it's, it, was, it seems accurate uh, to, to my, the best of my recollection. I th that uh, that Floricanto piece is pretty much, you know, on, uh, is to what I remember. You know, I, I remember him speaking like that. But there was like a um, that kind of uh, L.A. Uh, kind of you know mix of Mexican, Mex you know, mix of like Spanish, English, Spanglish, or you know whatever you want to call it, and that kind of accent. And you know, like especially like uh, folks from East LA, and you know, like they would have a way of saying instead of saying Los Angeles or LA, he would he would say, um, "I'm from LA, LA," you know, and it would be like an accent that you could. You know, I, I, I played music for a long time, so I have really sensitive ears. I, I, I pick up these these little nuances, you know, and uh, but that would that 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 uh, East LA, you know, kind of. Um, accent I know he, he kind of uh, took that on uh, for a while um, well and which made sense because he was living right there in the heart of East LA I mean that's where really where he lived most of the time um, um, uh, but the um, yeah as far as the inflections and the uh, the intensity and the, the emotions I would say it's uh, uh, it seems to be what I remember you know yeah I don't have any other. Um, I wish I had some other. Rec I, I, I've got um, well that one recording that's in the library. That's a good one. The uh, Santa, Santa Barbara, Barbara library. Yeah, um, that really shows. Um, that shows. That shows. You know uh, some interesting things about his 
like because I remember, as I recall, at one point he um, he was uh, he was trying to get me to um, to talk, you know, and I was really quiet and shy, and I didn't really want to say anything, and uh, and so the other guy that was in there, Al, you know, he was kind of supporting me and telling my dad, hey, just you know, leave him alone, leave him alone. He's it's okay. He doesn't have to talk, you know. But my dad was like, you know, trying to get me to say something, and and um, uh, you know, he he. he uh, he could be really, uh, you know, overpowering, uh, you know, and, and, and you know sometimes, and you know he would uh, say things that like, you know, were really intense, and you know, but uh, that's just, you know, that's just how he how he spoke, you know, he just said what was on his mind, you know, he really didn't, uh, he he didn't hide things. He wasn't the kind of person, you know, that um, kept things from me. I don't know if you're able to say, but um, what did living in San Francisco mean for your father? And um, is that where you're based now? Yeah, that's yeah. right. I'm based in San Francisco. Yeah. Yes. What does it mean for you now? Uh, well, I think for him, uh, uh, they um, uh, let's see. He got to San Francisco because my mom had been. My mom was working at a, a hospital down in Modesto, uh, a couple hours outside of. Uh, San Francisco and so uh, she had been living in San Francisco after she, she first came out there you know in, um, in the 50s from St. Louis with her sister and so they you know they slowly uh, basically that became their new home and um, um, I I think that uh, the San Francisco was um, San Francisco was always like kind of um, a really big place especially for somebody who's from Desto um, Modesto has grown a lot in recent years, but at that time it was still a pretty small town and a you know small agricultural town. And you know there, there and there still are you know people that uh, have never you know wouldn't even think about going to San Francisco or you know if they had it'd be like you know going to some far away place that, that they just wouldn't really know what to do there and how to cope with it. Um, but um, so I don't know. It was it was kind of I guess maybe geographically like. Uh, um, a, uh, a place that he identified with because it um, had, um, you know, a diversity that um, he really didn't have, you know, in, uh, in uh, Riverbank. Riverbank, you basically just had the, uh, the, uh, the, the white folks and the Mexicans on the other side of the, tra of the uh, train track. You know, that's kind of how it was divided up. And, um, um, but, you know, San Francisco kind of like opened up things to him and, uh, uh, and then with when when he was up there, um, there was uh, all the uh, the Beat Generation uh, writers. You know, were just uh, I get their stuff was coming out, and so he was kind of uh, he was up there. I guess a, just a few years after that, but uh, still close enough. And so um, I, don't know, I I think it was a place where he felt comfortable. You know, he could write. Um, he liked. Um, you know, he lived in a lot of different places in San Francisco. He lived in apartments. He lived in uh, hotels. There was one place in the uh, Mission District where he stayed for, gosh, it seemed like months uh, on end. And, you know, it was like his favorite place. You know, and, and it was just this little tiny, you know, kind of uh, smelly, you know, hotel room. And But, you know, he liked it because he could write. You know, he could be, like, alone and with his little typewriter and just, you know, crank out the pages. Um, so... I think uh, you know you'd always would identify with San Francisco uh, in many ways. But, um, as you know, if, as, as far as I'm I, I'm concerned, uh, I I live in a little town uh, called Mill Valley. It's right outside of San Francisco, and and um, uh, about 15 miles. And but you know we're 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 always in the city, and, and you know so I I don't know I I kind of think of it as my 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 home. Um, I've gone away a lot and been to different places, but you know, always kind of come back there. And, um, it's uh, you know, I don't know. It's um, for me just uh, I have a lot of memories there, and you know, I spent a lot of time there as a kid. But um, so it, it, it's uh, it, it's changed though, you know, quite quite a bit. You know, it has changed. Still, will always be San Francisco. You know, there's always going to be hills and. <laughs> yeah. Windy fog. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when did you first read Brown Buffalo, and what was your experience reading it? 
say um, I guess uh, I first read it when uh, uh, when my dad read it to me so I guess now that's not necessarily me you know reading it myself um, but uh, you know I, I read a lot to my kids and you know I was just thinking about that you know actually that's kind of it was kind of neat you know for him to actually read it so you know to well the fill this that's not a barber. He's reading. Right, Rambo. right, right, right. But he actually did that when he was writing it. You know, he would like he would you know write uh, you know write all day, and then uh, if if I was around or you know because I was I was there with during a lot of the writing, um, or if my aunt was there, whoever was there, he would just say, okay, you know, why don't you guys come and sit down, and I want I want you to listen to what I wrote, and so you know he'd read it, and you know, we talk about it, but uh, but um, I didn't. I, I guess I I first read it when. Um, when it came out, uh, which was in the early 70s. 72. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I really, I, I don't think I, I, you know, there's, I think a lot of things in there that I really didn't understand. Um, but I think I did actually read it straight through probably about that time. Um, and then uh, I guess since then I've, you know, uh, probably gone through it, um, you know, a few times uh, over the years. Um, um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting to, to, to read read it uh, at different times in your life. You know, you kind of um, you understand uh, things differently. Um, uh, I guess like you know, just like all, all literature, really. You know, you, you you read it at certain time periods and have different different perspective on it. Do you like it? But, um, Is it your kind of? Uh, yeah, you know, it, I I like it. Uh, because it's uh, uh, direct and uh, and simple in terms of the the, the, the language, um, but um, I would say that in some ways it's kind of too close to me, and so I almost don't, you know, I, I, there's a part of me that doesn't really want to read it, you know, because it's like, you know, there, there's some things that were uh, not necessarily you know, joyous, and there was, you know, some things that were, you know, I, I wouldn't say, you know, really, really bad memories, but things that, you know, that may, kind of brings things up in my in my mind, you know, uh, with regard to some of the family, and, and so, you know, I, I think uh, now some of it was fictionalized, and, but, um, so in, in a sense, I kind of, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I, I put up a wall, you know, in, in some ways. Um, uh, what, some of the what, one of the stories that I that I that I actually thought was 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 very interesting and that I actually um, was able to to really uh, uh, kind of um, get into in some ways and, and, and not have that kind of reaction was that uh, short story it was a couple of his short stories you know because they weren't like um, so personal you know and, and 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 I know one of them was the uh, the Perla like it's pig and. Um, uh, that I think was a really fine piece. Um, so, and then there's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say a couple of other short stories. But. Wow, what a wealth of information you've given us. Yeah. Well, I you didn't it, expect this. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a there's a lot. There's so much more. I mean, you can only do so much in, in a couple of hours. But. Yeah. One last question, anyone? You're from, I'm from, originally from Mexico, but I also live in the Central Valley. Oh, okay, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So um, you mentioned a lot about um, Henry Thompson, um, but I was, um, I was also aware that um, he had some interaction with Hemingway, um, and I wanted to see how this played into his writing. Like, um, do you know anything about um, his um, like relationship with Hemingway? Um, well, I think that, um, what I do know is that he read a lot of Hemingway, um, and you know, he probably influenced his writing. I, 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 I'd say in some ways, um, he, he I, I don't know if he actually ever met up with him in real life, um, but he did on his way back to um, Colorado. I remember, I think uh, he somebody had uh, given him some contact to. Hemingway's grave, and like he wanted to go and you know visit it, 
and so I, I, I think that actually happened. But uh, but yeah, he he he, he read uh, quite a bit of Hemingway, um, and then I I, I I think that you know for sure influenced his writing. Um, I would say probably what I what little I know about you know Hemingway's life, they they probably were very uh, similar. Uh, characters, you know, in many ways, um, just, you know, really, uh, complex, larger than life kind of, you know, figures. And, uh, it's, I don't know, the, 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 the writer's life is, uh, it's very strange. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I could do it. You know, I, I, uh, try to write a little bit and, you know, I write letters and, and, you know, I, I try to write a couple of stories and, and, um, and I just, you know, I just, I don't want to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> it's just something that, you know, you have to be so consumed with and, and so driven. And it's something that, you know, you, that, that focus and that intensity. Uh, and, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm glad there are people that are able to do it, you know. But, um, yeah, good question. Thank you, uh, thank you all thank for inviting me down. I really appreciate it. Uh, happy to come back anytime. Yeah, after all these years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, little photo.